Well, one of the things that um, obviously that we celebrate Mark on Mother's Day and Father's Day is just the responsibility that comes along with parenting, what pairing is all about and the, the sacrifices that, that we make for the sake of our kids. And as I was thinking about the whole um, responsibility of, of parenting, parenting and what that is about, it sort of is, is, I think, intuitive for us to understand it as sort of filling in the gaps. We, we fill in the gaps for our parents or for our kids, uh, excuse me, between that which they, they don't know that we have come to know, right? Or, or that which they are unable to do and, and we are able to do. So in that effort, we, because we love our kids, we place different kinds of restrictions around them in order to provide for their, their safety and, and ultimately for their protection. So as parents, it's a, it's a responsibility of ours to sort of, again, bridge this gap. So we say, hey, things like, don't eat a steady diet of, of sugar because we understand that that sort of diet ultimately doesn't lead to a place of, of health. And so we, we put restrictions around that and we say there's limitations around that. And we say, hey, don't play near the street because we understand that there's dangers there that our kids don't necessarily uh, intuitively understand for themselves. And so I grew up, like most of you, with a set of rules and expectations that my parents put in place for my benefit. And, and I would say that my parents were probably on the, like, uh, we'll be pretty clear about our expectations and rules for your safety and protection and, and pretty clear on, my, on their expectation that I'm going to follow those. So I remember once in middle school, um, a friend of mine and, and I were out riding our bikes. Like This is back in the day when kids uh, rode their bikes places. Like I lived in a small town in Ohio. We just rode everywhere. That was just what we did. And, and, and we were out, and, and my friend was trying to talk me into something. Um, and he was kind of like, hey, let's go do this. And, and I was kind of milling it around. And ultimately, I just said to him, I was like, hey, there's, there's, I'm not doing this. Like, I know my parents' rules, and I'm not going to go do this thing. And, and he's like, like they're never going to find out. And I was like, my parents always find out. <laughs> like, I don't know what they're, who they've got on their team or whatever, but they always find out. And he said, you know what? You would be such a different person if it wasn't for your parents. And I looked and I said, you are so right. <laughs> like, I understood that in, in that moment. We understand that. And, and this morning, as we are continuing now in our series on the Holy Spirit, the person in the work of the Holy Spirit, and just sort of by way of a reminder, kind of where we've been over the first several weeks of this, um, we've, we've discovered that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And so he's fully God, and his arrival into our world and into our lives was promised by Jesus. And it was promised by Jesus for the purpose of continuing the work of Jesus. So that which Jesus began in us, the Holy Spirit has come as a, is, is, is a part of our lives in order to continue that work. We've discovered that the Holy Spirit is a person, and so as a person, we can have relationship with him. He's not this ambiguous, um, arbitrary force that's hovering around, and, and we try to somehow mystically tap into it. No, he's, he's got personhood, and so we can talk to him and be in relationship with him. He is at work in the world in order to convict the world. And by that, it means he's, he's at work in the world in order to convince people of their need for Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit then in us, he begins to expose and, and, and to remove those things that don't belong, that aren't a part of, of who Jesus is. So he takes things like, like greed and selfishness and pride and, and disunity and prejudice and unchecked anger and, and, and many other things, he, and he makes us aware of those things because he wants to pull those out of us. And he begins to put back and replace these things that come from Jesus, like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and, and faithfulness and self-control, and he, he wants to add those things to our life. And so this is his work in us. And we've learned together that the work of the Holy Spirit then is absolutely essential. It's critical in our efforts and our attempts to, to follow Jesus. We're here as followers of Jesus, and we need the Holy Spirit in our life to help us do that. So the more that we understand, the more that we pay attention to his work in our lives, and the more that I then align myself with that work, 
the more ultimately effective I am and, and will be in these, this call that God's placed on my life to follow Jesus, the, the call that he's placed on your life, this call that he's placed on my life to, to love God and to love others. We need the Holy Spirit to help us do that. And of all the aspects that we've talked about as it relates to who the Holy Spirit is and, and what he does, this, this discussion that we're going to have today about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, how he, how he prays for us, this aspect of the Holy Spirit's work strikes me as uniquely parental. Like this, is, this is how I understand this. It's the work of filling in the gaps between the known and the unknown, between my inability and his ability. Let's begin by looking at Romans chapter 8, which we've, we've glanced at the last couple weeks um, as it refers to the Holy Spirit, but we're going to take a, a kind of a further look at what he wants to teach us about who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. So this is down in verses 26 and 27. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Rome here. He says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so Paul's drawing out here a couple things about this work of the Holy Spirit in, in interceding on our behalf. And he begins by helping us understand the nature of our weakness. Our weakness. I, uh, I don't know if you've ever had one of those things that in life where it's just like, I can't do this. Like For whatever reason, you, the way you're wired, the way that you work, how your brain works, you're unable to do something. When I was in grad school at Wheaton uh, uh, College, I was a Christian history major. And, um, and so there was a class that I took as an elective called Christian Hymnody, which is which study, it was a history elective, but, but what I didn't pay attention was it was also a music elective. Um, and so it was studying kind of the history behind these lyrics and the, when they were written and the story, and I, I found that fascinating. But what was a part of this class was, was the music behind them. And so we would have these quizzes every Friday where they would play on the piano. One of the professors would play on the piano the tune. And you may not know this, but when you look at like hymns, there's the name of the hymn, which sort of reflects the lyrics. But then oftentimes the tune itself is pulled from somewhere else. And that tune has a specific name. So the professor would play a portion of this hymn tune and we would have to identify it and write the name down. So, for instance, all creatures of our God and King, famous hymn written, the lyrics written by St. Francis of Assisi, the, the hymn tune for that name is Lastus Unis Unfriner, okay, which I could be German, I don't know, I really just made that pronunciation up, so if you speak German, I apologize, but these professors would play this tune, and I wouldn't have to think of all, God, all creatures of our God and King, I would have to think of whatever I just said, and I couldn't do it. Like, no matter, I would sit at home, I would study, I would listen, I would play these tunes, and I would get to it. My wife would quiz me ahead of time, so I practice, and it would be like Amazing Grace, and she'd play it on the piano, and I'd be like, I don't know, I've got nothing, like, you know. Like, for, for whatever reason, no matter how hard I worked, my brain can't do that. Like, it, it, it can't take those notes and recognize it and, and string it together. And see, this is... This is what the Holy Spirit, this is what Paul wants us to understand about what the Holy Spirit is doing here. He's speaking into that place of our lives where he's saying, look, you don't have the ability. Like, you can't do this. Look back and again in Romans 8. We're going to look at some of what precedes what we just read. This is what Paul writes. This is verses 18 um, and following. He says, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So Paul here, just, just by way of background, Paul is having this very honest conversation with, with these Christ followers, these followers of Jesus who's living in Rome. And, and he wants them to understand, he wants to speak into the nature of the, their suffering. He wants to speak into the persecution that they are experiencing because they have chosen to follow Jesus. So Paul describes their current reality, where there is both hope and, and confidence because it says they've been adopted as sons and daughters of God, and yet, even in the midst of that, they remain in a broken world. So Paul writes earlier in verse 15, he says, for we did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom you cry, Abba, Father. So he uses this really relational, really personal term to describe how they are connected with God. More like the equivalent of the English of, of saying daddy. But then he goes on to say in the middle of verse 23, he says, we groan inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So he's saying the Holy Spirit is, is convincing you of this, and yet we are also waiting for it. So essentially, Paul writes and says, yes, yes, you are children of God. We've been brought into his family. There, there's, there's, we, can, we can have the confidence of knowing we're his sons and daughters, but there's more to come. There's more that we wait for eagerly. The day when we will possess this this full inheritance. What he's describing is, is when we will one day be with God in eternity. Because right now the experience of this is, is in the midst of this broken world. And in the midst of this broken world, there's, there's groaning and there's weakness in the midst of, of the pain and suffering. In verse 22, he actually compares it or uses this illustration with the pains of childbirth. Right? This this. Which, by the way, how does he know, right? <laughs> but he talks about this pain that awaits this great, this great arrival of, of joy and hope. It's interesting here that what Paul describes is both drastically different than, than our own reality and yet incredibly relatable. Because as much as, as we would not look at our situation and describe it as facing genuine persecution because of our faith in Jesus... And, and, and we recognize that Paul's writing into a very different context. But, but the pain and the suffering that he writes about continues because we continue to live in this broken world. And because we live in this broken world, we have limitations. We have an inability to experience this, this hope and this promise until the fullness of it is achieved someday in heaven. And so now Paul is saying, look, this is the nature, and in your human condition, you have limitations, and it's in the midst of that limitations that the Holy Spirit works. This is, this is where he does his work. He says even that in the midst of our limitations, we don't even know how to pray. They, it, it, like we don't have the words for it, and now here is where we discover the Spirit's work. The Spirit's work. I, uh, one of the things I admire about you moms is, uh, at least about my wife and raising our kids, I think I've seen this other places too, is how you have this ability um, to be able to hear your child cry and identify the need that that cry represents. So like, I don't know, dads, we don't have this. Like, we can tell between, like, I'm really hurt cry and I can continue to watch the football game cry. Like, that's, that's sort of all we've got. But, but my wife would be able to hear one of my daughters crying and know if it was like a dirty diaper, know if it was time for a nap, know if she was hungry, know if she was just restless and needed attention. Like, it was amazing to me. Like, th th this, her ability to speak and to understand and to be able to translate the needs of this, this infant child. And, and, and what Paul is describing here in Romans 8 is not unlike that very thing. While we remain in this in this in between, we eagerly wait for the fullness of our inheritance. It's the Holy Spirit in that waiting who transforms our prayers. 
Look again at verse 26. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I don't know if you have ever encountered someone in a, a state of shock, like genuine shock. But if you have, you know that oftentimes in that state, they lack the ability to be able to articulate their, what they're feeling and, and what they need. And Paul here is, is describing a similar state of spiritual desperation. He described earlier in, in verse 22 how all of creation is groaning as a result of living in this broken world. And then in verse 23, he talks about how we personally as followers of Jesus, we continue to grow as we wait for this redemption of our bodies. But in the midst of all of that inability, our lack of even knowing what to pray for, here's the promise. The Spirit intercedes for us. I think there are a couple of implications of what Paul's saying here. First, we discover that this, this work of the Holy Spirit is a work that's done in us. It's a work that's done in us. If you look at verse 16 in chapter 8, Paul writes this. He says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So it's the Spirit's work to remind us of our identity. Like I, I picture this like those moments you have when your kids where maybe they've made a bad decision or you've had to correct something and they're grieving that and they're mourning and they're wondering if this relationship between them and, and you is somehow damaged and you hold their face in your hands and you look at them and you say, you will always be my daughter. You, you will always be my son. Yes, this thing has to be corrected or this has to be dealt with, but you will always be mine. Like this is the Holy Spirit's work in us, according to Paul. It's God holding our, our face in his hands and saying, you're my son. You're, you're my daughter. Your identity is rooted in me. We pray, Abba, Father, we pray to, to Dad. But he also then lets us know that this is work that he does in us is also a work that he does for us. Because the Holy Spirit knows us, and because he knows us, he's able to give words to, to our groans and to our struggles. I, I picture this as, as the Holy Spirit as a translator of sorts. The one who is able to take which, that which I am, I am even unable to express and to, to articulate, and he presents it before a loving Father in perfect clarity. Exactly representing the, the need of my heart. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that, that allows us to experience God in in our prayers. Um, throughout this entire series, as we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, I've been reticent to, to use illustrations that I feel like are um, extreme or, or um, uncommon. And it's not that they're uncommon, it's just that, that sometimes they're so personal that, that when you share those stories, it's difficult for people to connect to. Or we take that and we think, well, why hasn't that happened to me? And the Holy Spirit must not be working in me as, as he is now. But this aspect of the Holy Spirit's work is something where I've experienced it in my life, and it's been very personal. I can remember a time in student ministry, and I've told this story before, but where I was struggling. This was years ago. I was a youth pastor in Wheaton, and I was totally doubting my call. I was doubting whether or not God had me in the right place, and I was, I was doubting whether or not I was at all capable of doing the things that I felt like I was in a position to do, and, and I was struggling. And I had this student in my group at the time who, who was sort of an outcast kid. Um, he, he would often stand on the wall by himself. He, he had um, lacked social ability, and, and oftentimes when he talked, it would be unclear and hard to understand. And so he's just kind of this unique kid that was on the fringe and, and only sort of partially involved. I'm not even sure how he became connected in the group and what his story was, and, and he was just one of those kids. And I remember um, one day following, like we had Wednesday night youth group at the time, and one day we were following that evening, and I was just feeling particularly discouraged and particularly beat down, and just like, what am I, I'm wasting, I'm spinning my wheels here. I'm wasting my time. And I remember walking out into the hall, we'll call this kid George, and, and George um, came up to me, and um, in perfect clarity, he starts to describe what he saw God doing that evening in youth group. 
like things that I didn't see at all. And, and he's just this amazing, articulate, well-spoken kid, and he's just describing all of this. And, I mean, and then he ends, and he's saying, you know, that reflects your leadership. I was just like, what? Like, I've never heard George speak a coherent sentence in, in his life. And he just, in this moment, he just lays all to bear the exact need of my soul. Like, exactly where I was at. And I have no doubt in my mind, and you can look at that and be like, that's circumstance, or that was luck, or whatever that was. In my heart, and my world, I know that that was the Holy Spirit asking the Father on my behalf for the very thing I didn't even need, I didn't even know I needed to ask for. And God meeting that need. See, this is what Paul's describing about what the Holy Spirit does for us when he intercedes on our behalf. And all, by the way, he also invites us to do this for each other. This thing that he's done in us, this thing that he does for us, he also includes us in doing that for others. When God lays that burden on your heart, wakes you up at night, or, or just gives you some thought that says, hey, I need to pray for this person. He's including you in his work of interceding before the Father on behalf of someone else. That they may not even be able to speak that. They may not even have the words to articulate that need, but the Holy Spirit's including you in his work. And he's doing all of this. All of this is directing us to the Father's will. Look back at, at Romans 8, 27. The Father's will. This is what Paul writes. He says, And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So what Paul writes here is so important. Because how do we know we can trust what the Holy Spirit is doing? How do we know we can trust his intercession? How do we know that we can rely on that? Because he does so according to the will of the Father. It's in alignment with his good and perfect will. And again, what Paul writes here, I understand most intuitively in, in parental terms. Because as adults, we, we understand that you can't, that parenting or, or leading kids in our lives isn't a matter of indulging everything that they ask for. We, we make decisions all the time about what is good for them, and we see unrestricted indulgence just leading to disastrous results. But it's the Holy Spirit who, who takes the groans of our hearts, who is interceding on our behalf, and, and he does so in perfect alignment with God's good and, and, and his, his will for our lives. He takes it and he wants to draw out that which God is doing. So God, who, who it says it searches our hearts, he hears those prayers. And he answers those prayers because they are in agreement with his desire for us. See, here's the thing about the Holy Spirit's intercession for you, is that this isn't about getting more of our wish list. The Holy Spirit's intercession for us is about getting more of him. It's about getting more of, of who God is, knowing him better. It's about meeting that need in our lives. And the result is that we get more of, of him. Then we begin to see that ultimate benefit. What, what Paul would refer to in verse 28 as all things working together for the good. There's that famous scene in, in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol where the, uh, uh, Scrooge is with the, the, the first, the spirit of Christmas past. And he asked him, Why, what business brought you here? And the Spirit's answer to him is, says, it's for your welfare. And, and Scrooge thinks in, in, in his mind, he thinks, well, a, a continuous night of sleep would have been more, uh, more for my welfare. And the Spirit who hears his thoughts says, well, then for your reclamation then. See, this is what, what Paul's describing and the good that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us is that we would know more of him and in that knowing more of him we would become we would be men and women who are being shaped to be more like jesus and he is interceding towards that end on our behalf that's the work that he's doing in our life in perfect alignment with the father's will this morning as as we conclude if you've been around here before you've heard us oftentimes talk about how we view this community as a family and so on mother's day yes we celebrate our the mothers who raised us, whether it was an adoptive mother or a, a biological mother, we celebrate that. But we also see this as an opportunity to celebrate all of the, the spiritual moms and the spiritual aunts and the spiritual sisters and 
all of the women that God has placed in our lives who have been a part of, of our story. And so as we conclude this morning, I've asked Libby Tate to come, and she is going to offer a prayer of, of blessing for um, all of the women of our church. Libby, would you come and, and close our service? I'd like to ask if you're able for all the women in the room to stand, please. And let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this day of love and of springtime and of hope. And we thank you that we gather here to worship you, Jesus to give you praise and to glorify your name with our hearts, our minds, and our lives. And today, Lord God, we recognize the women in this room. Lord, for the mothers that pour out their hearts for their children, we praise you. Lord, for the grandmothers, the aunts, the sisters that love their families in big and small ways, we praise you. Lord Jesus, for all women that love you by loving others, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, that you have designed us as children to live in complete dependence, first and foremost on you, and then on one another. And we thank you for the women in this room that have answered that call to care for those around them, for children, for husbands, for family members, friends, neighbors, the church, and our community. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we recognize that this day can be a day of great celebration for mothers and for children. And may our praise raise up to you from this place. We thank you. And you alone, God, are worthy. But Lord, we also know that this day can be a time of heartache for some women. And we recognize the women in this very room that are hurting. For those women in this room that long to be mothers but are still waiting, Lord, draw near to them. For those women in this room that have lost children in death or other means, draw near to them. Lord, for those women in this room that are grieving the loss of their own mother, draw so near to them. May we have the comfort of knowing that your love for us is constant, your understanding is perfect, and your compassion, Lord God, is never ending. Jesus, fill the women in this room with your hope and your courage. Bless them, hold them, protect them, ignite them with the Holy Spirit. May they know that you, Abba Father, see them, that you created their inmost being, that you call each one of these women by name. Father, we ask that you give them strength, that they are transformed by the power of your resurrected son, and they are filled with the understanding of your profound love for each one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us at Chapel Street Church today. If you are in need of prayer, our wonderful prayer team will be up here and would be love to um, take the time to pray for you. And it's so good to have you. Have a happy Mother's Day.